So let me call this geometries or magnetic field. Before we talk about geometries for magnetic field, I want to start by recapping something that you learned in electrostatics. So in electrostatics, we started by covering Coulomb's law, uh, which says the electric field due to a point charge Q is given by Coulomb constant times the amount of the point charge divided by R squared times R hat for direction. And um, you can do quite a lot with it. And in fact, when you have point charge, this gives you a very intuitive feel for electric field. But pretty soon, this becomes difficult to work with extended charge distribution. Like if you have an infinite line of charge, then you have to do integral. If you have a plane of charge, which is actually quite common, um, like in capacitors, um, you have to do double integral. So what we introduced is Gauss's law, which says the surface integral of E dot dA over a closed surface is equal to amount, uh, let me <laughs> use the, the, the co uh, coefficients we are using, uh, 4 pi times Coulomb constant times the charge enclosed. Or if you want to use constants that your textbook uses, you just replace this with uh, 1 over epsilon naught, so you get this version, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now, when we introduced this, it was with the intention of using it to calculate the electric field. But one difficulty that we quickly run into is that the quantity that we are interested in, electric field, is inside an integral. So, and <laughs> it's not like you can take a derivative of each side to get electric field. So in order to recover electric field, we need to go through some uh, proof argument steps to be able to pull out the electric field outside of the integral. So what we had to rely on were symmetry arguments. So we had to use a symmetry argument. And when you are using symmetry arguments, you are limited in what geometries you can apply it to. If you have just an arbitrarily shaped uh, charge distribution, you, there's no symmetry argument to use there. So what you have to do is you have to limit yourself to being able to calculate electric field of a highly symmetric distributions. So we covered some examples of those geometries. You have lecture videos on all that. So we did it for, I guess, um, well, we have a cylindrical geometry. That would be a line of charge. And we had a planar geometry that would be uh, infinite plane of charge. And these geometries had a certain uh, symmetries that allowed you to re constrain what directions of electric field can be. And that allows you to simplify this expression enough to say that electric field either comes out of the integral or for some of the surfaces that uh, e dot dA along those surfaces is zero. And the final symmetry was the spherical uh, symmetric geometry. And point charge would be actually an example of that. Although uh, with the Gauss's law, you can expand it quite a bit. You can use, use this to calculate electric field due to a uniformly charged sphere in all the regions of space. So this is a reminder, a uh, review of what we did in electrostatics. And what I now want to say is what we will do is um, a magnetism version of that. So let me just shrink down this text to size so that I have more room to write down what we are doing now, the magnetism stuff. So this is what you did in electrostatics. Now what we'll do in magnetism as a reminder of what we have done. Uh, so in magnetism so far, we have introduced Biot-Savart's law. We said that small contribution to the magnetic field due to a small segment of wire, current carrying wire, is given by this uh, relationship. K E 
over c squared times um, the the current is the source of magnetic field. So this I D L is what indicates that it's the um, amount of current in a small segment of wire, and the direction and and there's a over R squared. Because of magnetism is still inverse square law. It goes as inverse square of uh, distance, at least for point sources. Now, the direction of magnetic field is quite complicated. It's all captured in IDL cross R hat. This cross product works out all the complicated directions. And in lecture, you see me using Biosavart law to drive magnetic field for a um, long line of uh, current and uh, and for loop of current. So you can watch that. Um, oh, and just uh, before I move on to the next point, um, if you want to use the combination of constant coefficients that your textbook gives you, then this portion is uh, mu naught over 4 pi. So that's uh, what we have done in magnetism so far. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to be introducing Ampere's law. And as we introduce Ampere's law, it'll be very useful for us to identify geometries where there will be sufficient symmetry for us to be able to use Ampere's law to calculate the magnetic field. So what we will do soon, we will introduce Ampere's law which says, so Ampere's law looks different from Gauss's law, although there are some superficial similarities. Ampere's law will say that the closed integral, and closed integral not of surface, but of a, a loop, a path, a one-dimensional integral. So closed integral of dot product of magnetic field and path element. And this path element, even though DL looks exactly like this DL, they have a slightly different meanings. So this is of wire, current carrying wire. This is of what I like to call Amperian loop. So this is a kind of imaginary path that you define for calculation A. This DL is a physical uh, length of uh, current carrying wire. So anyways, Ampere's law says that this integral takes a certain form that, um, that's related to the source of magnetic field. So it says this is equal to 4 pi times Ke Coulomb constant for some reason. Well, same as, uh, same as Biot-Savart's law. Coulomb constant divided by C squared times current enclosed. And there is quite a bit of similarity between what you see here and what you saw with uh, Gauss's law. So Gauss's law says that charge is the source of electric field, and Ampere's law will be saying current is source of magnetic field. Now, we will have to, because in this expression, we have the exact same problem we had electric, uh, the, the Gauss's law for electric field. What we are interested in is not the uh, integral, the B dot DL. I don't care what the quantity that is. I don't, it doesn't hold any interest for me. What I will be interested in is the magnetic field, and that's inside an integral. So what we need is some way to get this quantity out of the integral. And in order to do that, we need symmetry arguments. So, so in the next uh, five to 10 minutes, I will identify and illustrate those geometries with high degree of symmetry that'll allow us to uh, do this exact thing. Pull out the magnetic field out of the integral or for some sections, argue that B dot DL should be zero. So we need to identify geometries with high degree of symmetry. I think some geometries are, um, it's more natural to think of uh, that symmetry. Um, so for example, in the case of Gauss's law, we had a cylindrical uh, geometry. So um, I think a cylindrical geometry will still provide uh, some high enough degree of symmetry to use symmetry argument to simplify that integral. 
So we'll have cylindrical geometry where some symmetry argument will have um, footing. And what this will look like is uh, something like, uh, Im imagine a long line of current, long straight line of current. So if you had a long wire, and I'm going to draw only a finite section of the wire, but you have to imagine that this is infinitely long for this uh, symmetry argument to work. So let me just indicate that they don't end at the end. And current flows in some one direction. And this is one such geometry where there's enough of a symmetry. So when we were doing Gauss's law, uh, cylindrical geometry had rotational symmetry about the y, the, the center of the cylinder as an axis. And it had, um, it has a so rotation on, and it has a translational symmetry because it's infinitely long. You can translate it and not really change anything. And it had, um, and I think that was more or less it. We do Gauss's law, we had a, a reflection symmetry. With Ampere's law, because the current has a direction, it won't really have a reflection symmetry. So this uh, exhibit uh, rotational, and I'm writing this out down as a shorthand, you have to remember, it's rotational about one particular axis, not any other axis. It has translational symmetry, and I think that's it. And it's useful to kind of think through what what direction in general the magnetic fields are for these uh, geometries. And this is where the right-hand rule, um, I think this is like the second version of right-hand rule is really helpful. So you uh, direct your thumb in the direction of the current and your uh, remaining four fingers they curl in the direction of the, uh, the, so the direction that these four fingers curl in is the same direction that uh, the tangential magnetic fields are circling around the current. You can uh, get this uh, from application of Bio Savart's law and this uh, shortcut right hand rule is a way to remember that. So with the current flowing from left to right or th at the top, the magnetic field will be coming out of the screen so let me just uh, draw that. You, at the top, you have magnetic field coming out of screen. The, it uh, turn, wraps around in a circle, and at the bottom, the current is going into the uh, screen. So this is a circular kind of uh, magnetic field. So this is the uh, general sense of the magnetic field, and it, uh, it wraps around. Uh, it, and it's uh, because of the translation of symmetry, this, uh, as you uh, move about along this cylinder, the strength of this magnetic field doesn't change. So that's one geometry, and there's a quite close analog to um, geometries we've used for electricity. And we have the planar geometry. It's a, a bit... Um, so the sense in which this is a plane is... Um, it takes a bit of imagination because just the visualizing a plane um, is not enough <laughs> because it's not a stationary charge. It's a moving current. It's a moving charge. So you have to imagine a plane of current. I think one way to imagine it is to take this uh, line of current and imagine that replicating that over some plane so that you have a... Uh, in one plane, you have kind of line of current all moving in sync uh, in one direction. So I, I think for my drawing here, I'm going to imagine that my plane is composed of these uh, line currents that's going uh, that's going into and out of the plane that you see. Uh, le let me draw two views actually. For this line current, uh, let me just draw a version. So this is like the side view. And I can draw a view where the current is coming out of the uh, plane. And uh, so for this line current uh, coming out of the screen, you will have magnetic field that's going counterclockwise. So um, in this view, this is how the magnetic field looks like. And um, for the planar geometry, so if we imagine um, 
current that's uh, flowing from left to right as uh, it's doing in the cylindrical geometry, except there's many more cylinders both coming out of the plane and going into the plane. Then in the first view that I drew, it doesn't really change because it still looks like you have current that's flowing from left to right. Now, what changes is that in a view that looks like this, the, there's more than one line of current that's coming towards you. There's an infinite number of them extending uh, quite a bit. Uh, that's, um, I mean, you know, when we say infinite, what we really mean in practical terms is um, uh, extent that's much larger than any other relevant uh, length scales so that you can treat the size as being much larger than anything else. So in this geometry, I think as you look at this magnetic field and imagine how magnetic fields due to each individual contributions will add, you might get this um, sense that magnetic field above the current will point entirely to the left and magnetic field below the current will point entirely to the right. And if you have that sense, that's great. That's how they look. And I think uh, in a different lecture, I do a more detailed proof oriented argument for that. Um, and this is geometry has, uh, it has translational symmetry. You can see it in this picture where if you move to left or right, the current distributions don't change and magnetic field doesn't change either. And in this other view where my current is flowing from left to right, it'll look like where above the plane, the magnetic field is coming out of the, um, out of the screen towards you. And below the plane, magnetic field is going away, uh, going into the screen away from you. And unlike the picture on the left, there isn't a circle uh, of magnetic field lines connecting the top and bottom. It's just, they're just separated. Okay, so those two are the geometries where you can draw um, parallel to what you have seen in electrostatics. And they have some, um, so there's some sense of familiarity to it, even though the direction of field looks very different from the electric field directions. Now, if you try to think of a parallel to spherical geometry, what you will see is um, there isn't one. Because, I mean, what does a <laughs> spherical current even look like? It's like you're trying to imagine a point current. And then you maybe think, okay, so you could have maybe a loop of current that goes like, a, imagine you had a sphere of charge that's spinning. When you have a setup like that, uh, some of the symmetries you had in Gauss's law application goes away because if it's spinning, then there's now a special axis. So there isn't the same kind of rotational symmetry that you have, that you had for Gauss's law. You don't have that for magnetic field for Ampere's law. And that loss of symmetry is significant. So there isn't such a thing as a spherically symmetric uh, geometry where we can apply Ampere's law. So we lose one geometry of some symmetry, but we actually gain two. There are two geometries where when we are dealing with uh, um, electrostatics and Gauss's law, we would have said there's no meaningful symmetry there and we would have rejected it. But those now carry some meaningful, useful symmetry that we can use for applying uh, Ampere's law. So let me list and illustrate those two geometries. So those two geometries are, and uh, I'll just use the name that we'll be using for, uh, for them. So this is the third geometry. There's a solenoid geometry. I don't know if a solenoid is uh, just a pure geometry name or, um, uh, or it's uh, just referring to the device, whatever. Uh, I, I've only really used the term solenoid in referring to this kind of uh, current geometry that um, that works for generating magnetic fields. So I'll show that shortly. And the other geometry, and this one I know is a, a pure geometry term, a toroid geometry. And I think it's a better seen than described or, you know, I can describe it, but I think uh, it'll be easier for you to imagine it if you see it. So I have a setup here that'll help me 
illustrate uh, both the solenoid and toroid geometry. I have a separate camera over here that, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> looking at things here. Okay, I got to orient myself. Okay, so that's up. No, that's left. This is right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this is an example of a solenoid. I mean, you might think, hey, isn't that just a cylinder? Well, it's a kind of a cylinder. Um, but as you can see here in the center, it's a... Uh, wait, can I? Yeah, okay. In the center, it's empty. It's not filled the cylinder. And, it, and a solenoid can't be a filled cylinder. And really, when we talk about solenoid, we are not referring to this cylindrical shape of the thing. We are referring to the wires that are wrapping around here. So I think you can see here, there's a two leads to the wire that's going to these two leads. So when we are talking about solenoid, we are really talking about how the wire is wrapped around this uh, well cylindrical shell. Um, so it, it, this uh, wrapping around this cylinder is the solenoid. And I think for the solenoid uh, symmetries that we are going to talk about, um, this uh, kind of base of the cylinder has to be circular so that uh, so that it has a rotational symmetry about the axis that goes through it. And um, we are going to consider infinite solenoid. So this is not infinite, but we'll say for the one geometry we are considering, it's infinite. So it'll have translational symmetry. Because if this is infinite, then as you translate it, it shouldn't change. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's it. Those are the two main symmetries that will be useful in figuring out directional magnetic field and applying Ampere's law. So this is solenoid. And my toroid is, uh, this is the example of toroid. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit because I guess the toroids I have are much uh, smaller than the solenoid I have. Uh, okay, so this would be an example of toroid geometry um, or so you know if this reminds you of donut it's not entirely wrong but I think it is a bear so this is a ferrite core that we use for uh, electric circuits when we build the inductors now this uh, ferrite core alone isn't giving you the full picture of a, a toroid so really this would be the example of a toroid that's complete so when we talk about toroid we mean um, we are referring to how this wire is wrapping around. So when we consider how this wire is wrapped around, that is the toroid. And you know, ideally it would be uniformly wrapped, but this one I think, do I have something that's a bit better wrapped? Uh, I, on that toroid, I was just trying to wrap as uh, many wires as possible. This looks a little bit more uniform. Though so, um, for the purpose of our discussion, we'll assume that this wire is uniformly wrapped with a uniform density. Uh, that's a toroid. And um, I think for a lot of the calculations we'll do, we'll uh, imagine a toroid that looks exactly like this. As in, we'll consider a toroid where cross-sectional area, like if you imagine cutting this in half and looking at one uh, face, one side of it, uh, this one has a rectangular cross-section. And I think that's the most common toroid geometry we'll consider Although the symmetries that we'll discuss for toroid, it's not limited to that, but rectangular cross-section makes it easier for certain calculations. Uh, but you could have a circular cross-section if you want it, uh, or any other cross-section. So, so yeah, and with the toroid, the main symmetry that you have that turns out to be surprisingly useful is rotational symmetry. And really one only one symmetry, which is a rotational symmetry about the axis that's now perpendicular to this face. So this is a rotational symmetry. You can see how I, as I rotate this toroid, nothing is really changing. So that one symmetry alone actually gives you quite a bit of a simplification in figuring out the magnetic fields due to this object. We need to show that. <laughs> so let me just uh, draw those uh, geometries, uh, solenoid and toroid geometry. So with the solenoid, it would look something like, uh, let me have the solenoid be horizontally oriented. So if I'm describing the wire that's wrapping around, it would look something like, it would look, you know, 
some circular thing. And I'm going to draw this as one wire that's wrapping around because that's quite common. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you could actually you can imagine solenoid as a uh, infinite series of loops very closely uh, spaced together. If you treated it as that, that would not be wrong. Um, now, making all this one wire is a simpler in some sense because if it's all one wire, I can make a single current I go through all the uh, loops consistently. If you are independently controlling them, then that becomes a little bit hard. So this is a solenoid geometry. And as I was saying, it has um, symmetry with respect to rotation about an axis going through the center of the solenoid. So that's one symmetry it has. And there's a symmetry with respect to translation. And with those two symmetries in mind, the direction of magnetic field inside the solenoid, and let me just try to imagine it. Uh, let me just fix this down. So at the top, the, white, the current is coming out of the screen. At the bottom, current is going into the screen. So when you do that, um, the, your magnetic field, so, so, oh, this is the third right-hand rule where um, you can use this either with a solenoid or you can use this with a loop of current. So you uh, wrap your four fingers in the direction of current that's in a loop and your direction of your thumb gives you the direction of magnetic field at the center of the loop. So when I do this, um, then my thumb is pointing to the right and that tells me that in the center of the solenoid that magnetic field is mostly pointing to the right and um, magnetic field up here is also pointing to the right magnetic field here is also pointing to the right and outside the solenoid if and in the lecture there's another video where we go through this argument in more detail outside the solenoid if there were any magnetic field it would have to point to left um, this one you just use your regular right hand rule or your intuition about how the magnetic field goes around the loop of current so so that's a solenoid geometry and with a toroid geometry so this is the hardest one to draw that's why i uh, opted to show um show this so that you know to the extent that my drawing is not perfect you can imagine this and um, as you imagine different perspectives of this three-dimensional object that will hopefully make up for any uh, misleading um, uh, misleading things in my drawing. So, so, so let me just try to draw that in perspective view as best as I can. I'm just going to draw some rough outlines that I'll need to follow with this toroid geometry, inner radius, outer radius, and I'll try to draw one with a um, rectangular cross section. So with this uh, toroid, what's being referred to as toroid is not just, um, I think this is called annulus or donut. That, that's not the toroid. Toroid is how wire is wrapping around here. So let me wrap it so that at the top, it's coming um, up into the top and then it com comes out this way and then it wraps down at the bottom and then it wraps around. And like with the solenoid, I can complete this as a loop and just to imagine there are being independent loops, but most the common way we build these is with a single wire that wraps around this way. So something like that. Okay, my drawing is getting worse and worse. Uh, it's a quite three-dimensional shape, so it's, it is hard to draw. Um, you can imagine a, a kind of a top view. So, so let me just... Uh, just indicate that this goes on forever, all the way around uniformly. And if you are imagining a top view, a top view might look like this. You have uh, inner radius, outer radius, and along the inner radius, you do have a current that's poking out of the surface, viewed from top. And each one of these currents that come up, they go outward along the top surface of the donut and again uh, for our purposes you have to imagine this being uniform and along the outer uh, radius they go into the um, surface as viewed from top they go down along the outer wall of the donut 
and along the bottom they wrap around and return so that it can wrap around. So in this geometry, you really have one significant symmetry, which is a symmetry with respect to rotation about an axis that's going through the center of this. So there's a rotational symmetry there. And that rotational symmetry combined with uh, your sense of direction of magnetic field with, for a loop of current, it'll tell you, oh, so inside the uh, inside the here so let me try to use my uh, right hand rule so it's coming out of the screen so a magnetic field here will be pointed this way and you can kind of connect it around oh it goes in a circle so this is the direction of uh, magnetic field or drawing it in this top down view you would have magnetic field that goes around in circle and because it's, uh, uh, there's that rotational symmetry, you can argue the magnetic field here and here have same magnitude and all that stuff. So this is the fourth geometry in which Ampere's law can be applied, or uh, more specifically, Ampere's law can be used to calculate the magnetic field. So there's actually one more um, geometry in the application of Ampere's law than there was for Gauss's law. It, uh, um, I mean, you know, it, it, there's one more. Now, here's the good news. These four geometries are the only geometries where there is a enough degree of symmetry that you can pull the magnetic field out of the integral and find it using Ampere's law. This is the comprehensive list. There's no other list where uh, we can do the Say there, there's no any additional geometry where we can do the same thing. So, um, so yeah, the, 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 so I say that's the upside because this is the thing. Uh, in the lecture, you will see examples of application of Ampere's law using each of these four geometries. If you learn them all, then that's it. You've learned everything there is to know in applying Ampere's law.